This presentation is on the poet and playwright William Shakespeare. He was born in the town of Stratford-upon-Avon in 1564, on or around April the 23rd. He came from a large family, the third child and eldest son of John and Mary Shakespeare. Her maiden name was Arden, so he was born uh, in the same year as Christopher Marlowe, another famous playwright. There is his home in Stratford today. Uh, obviously, this is a mecca of literature lovers who uh, go to this town uh, to see his home and other sites associated with Shakespeare to this day. Definitely a tourist town. His father, John Shakespeare, was uh, successful, as you could tell from the house. Uh, he, was, he was a middle-class landowner, and he dabbled in small business, money lending, agricultural ventures, uh, he was esteemed within the community, and a few years after William was born, he was elected bailiff of Stratford-upon-Avon, and that was, basically he was the mayor of the town. It was the highest office in local government. John's ambitious business and political life would have given William many, many opportunities to observe uh, up close various kinds of performance, political events, uh, church rituals and theatrical entertainments, those are all the kinds of events that somebody in his father's position would have attended with his family. So um, from a very early age, Shakespeare was uh, exposed to performance and was aware of the power that performance could have on people. In the 1570s, he probably attends King Edward's the Sixth School, uh, this is another one of the public schools in the reformed education system at the time. Um, Christopher Marlowe was attending the King's School over in Canterbury, also in the 1570s. Uh, Shakespeare probably started there around the age of seven and would have continued until the age of 14 or so. This school is an excellent example of how the Protestant Reformation and the dissolution of the monasteries in the mid 16th century impacted English culture. So this school was formerly a religious school to prepare devout Catholics for holy orders, but the new school offered a very high quality secular education that emphasized literacy. Um, this would have included Latin study, and as a student there, Shakespeare would have been exposed to Roman drama uh, the comedies of the, of the Roman playwright Plautus and the tragedies of Seneca. So he would have, he would have seen uh, models of, of drama uh, from ancient times, and his early plays, in fact, show the influence of these models. He also would have been exposed to the poetry of Ovid, just as Marlowe had been over in Canterbury at the King's School. In 1582, at 18 years old, now Marlowe is at Cambridge uh, studying under a scholarship, but Shakespeare gets married. He marries a woman named Anne Hathaway. Um, she was already pregnant out of wedlock at the time, so um, they, they get married and their first child, um, a daughter named Susanna, is born in 1583, and she's followed a couple years later by twins. Hamnet and Judith, and Hamnet, his only son, uh, died at the at the age of eleven in uh, the mid fifteen nineties. Both daughters uh, grew up and eventually married. One of them got married, I think, right before right before Shakespeare died, in sixteen sixteen. In fifteen ninety two, and Marlowe's near the end of his life this year. But by this point, Shakespeare now in his late twenties is established in London and he's writing successful plays, mostly histories and comedies at this point. His histories actually were his most popular plays early in his career. We know very little about Shakespeare's private life. We do not know exactly when or why he left Stratford-upon-Avon to make his fortune in London nor do we know the circumstances surrounding his entrance into the theater business after he arrived there, or how he managed his family affairs while he was away. So in comparison to Christopher Marlowe, who was um, uh, 
um, a bachelor and and very much um, independent Shakespeare has family obligations and commitments. So very, very different situations for the for both men. He achieves literary fame in 1593, 1594, not with his plays, but with his poetry. Uh, he writes two narrative poems in Apillion called Venus and Adonis and another poem, The Rape of Lucrece, and he's writing his famous sonnets in the early 1590s. He wins the patronage of uh, a man named Henry Ridsley, who was the Earl of Southampton, who um, supports Shakespeare. Um, uh, and this was this was important because uh, Shakespeare um, was was not yet at the time a shareholder with the Lord Chamberlain's men. But by 1594, the Lord Chamberlain's men would receive their charter and they would hold exclusive rights to all of his new scripts. So the Lord Chamberlain's Men, the theater company with which Shakespeare is most closely associated, was chartered in 1594 by Henry Carey, the first Baron Hunston, who was the Lord Chamberlain in the court of Elizabeth I. So he, as Lord Chamberlain, he was responsible for overseeing all court entertainments, the master of the revels, worked under him, the Master of the Revels reported to the Lord Chamberlain. We have few records of the roles that Shakespeare played in the plays put on by the Lord Chamberlain's men. Uh, they didn't just perform Shakespeare's plays, they performed plays by other playwrights. Um, and there's nothing that shows that, that Shakespeare ever performed in his own plays, although we, we may assume that he did. Um, but, but the main roles, the leading roles in his plays were, were, were most likely played by a man named Richard Burbage, who was the most famous actor in his company and one of the most famous actors, in fact, in London at the time. He and um, Edward Allen, the Admiral's men. In 1596, he successfully applies to the Herald's College for a family coat of arms. This was an expensive process that elevated his family to the gentry. This is something his father was unable to do uh, in his lifetime. And Shakespeare apparently was successful enough as a playwright um, to, to do this for the family. The following year, he purchases a large home called New Place in Stratford-upon-Avon. It's kind of a funny story behind the sale of this house. It was protracted by the murder of the owner. Uh, the man who sold it to Shakespeare was murdered by his son named William Underhill. Really fascinating story. Um, so that slows down the acquisition of the house. But, but once Shakespeare has it, he begins purchasing large parcels of adjacent land over the next few years and starts, starts building a rather large estate in Stratford-upon-Avon. This even though his working life is very much centered in London. In 1598, we see the first quarto editions of early plays bearing Shakespeare's name. So um, obviously his reputation is strong enough that uh, publishers um, can, can put his name on a play and, and expect to sell it and make a profit. Uh, so that's a pretty significant development that also shows how popular Shakespeare was becoming at this time. In 1599, the Lord Chamberlain's men move from the uh, the theater and in in Shoreditch, which is north of London, and they 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 tear it down and move it across the Thames on the south side, and call it the Globe. And it opens in 1599 and competes with nearby theaters, the Swan and the Rose Theater, which is where uh, the Admiral's men performed at the time. In 1600, um, Hamlet is performed, and this is usually marked as the beginning of the period of his great tragedies. His great tragedies being Hamlet, of course, and then uh, King Lear and Othello, which we're reading, and Macbeth. In 1603, King James... Um, uh, replaces Queen Elizabeth 
as the monarch of England. She dies in 1603, and, and he is crowned king. And the Lord Chamberlain's men at that point is rechartered, and they, they become the king's men now. And that's what they would be for the rest of Shakespeare's life. 1609, his sonnets are published. In 1610, the Kingsmen begin performing indoors at a theater called Blackfriars. This was a former, the site of a former monastery that had been shut down, and the, uh, the building was repurposed as a theater in the late 16th century. And in 1610, the Kingsmen begin performing indoors there. This would allow them to perform in, in the winter, um, so it, you, you could perform year-round and not just in the warmer months. By this point, uh, Shakespeare is in semi-retirement, um, and he begins shifting his focus to managing his Stratford properties. Uh, so it, he, he does write more plays after 1610, but not, not at quite the pace that he had been the previous couple of decades. In 1613, the Globe Theater burns down after a cannon malfunction during a performance of Henry VIII. Um, Shakespeare remains a stakeholder after the theater is rebuilt, and this time it's rebuilt with a tile roof instead of a thatch roof uh, to help prevent something like that from happening again. I don't think, I don't think anyone was hurt in the fire. At least we have no record of it that I'm aware of. In 1616, after a lingering illness, Shakespeare dies on his 52nd birthday, and he's buried in Holy Trinity Church. There's a picture of it, and there's a, there's a picture of his marker inside the church. The grave of the poet William Shakespeare. In 1623, perhaps the most important edition uh, of, of literature ever, <laughs> the first folio is printed, 1623. Uh, were it not for this, we would have lost probably about half of Shakespeare's plays. Um, only only uh, about half were published, um, and the, the company held on to the, uh, the manuscripts, the foul papers, and and uh, manuscripts for Shakespeare's other plays. And in 1623, this large commemorative edition was published uh, and it's called the First Folio. And uh, there are very few of these left. Most of them are at the Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, actually. And that concludes this presentation on William Shakespeare.